Hello and welcome everyone. We are talking Edward Yang today. He is considered maybe, in my opinion at least, um, one of, if not the most important figures in the Taiwanese new wave cinematic movement. And I'm here today with Matt. We're going to discuss Edward Yang, two films from him, Terrorizers and A Brighter Summer Day, how much we appreciate Edward Yang, the director, and how great these two films are. If you haven't seen them, I can't recommend them highly enough. And I want to throw it to my co-host and guest, Matt, a.k.a. Warchamp on Letterbox, who recommended these films to me. Matt, let everyone know how you're doing. And also, if you don't mind, how you kind of came to be introduced to the films of Edward Yang. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, you know, I've been familiar with Edward Yang ever since I got on Letterbox like so many years ago now. Because I remember, as we were discussing before the pot, uh, before we started the podcast, his a lot of his movies are up there on the 250 uh, Letterbox top 250 list. And I remember, I think Yee Yee might be like the oldest or one of the oldest films in my watch list that I still have not seen actually, but I'm planning to do soon. And so he's been like sitting in my mind for a long time. Like, you know, I need to check this guy out. And one day, a few months ago, I think I, I saw like Yee Yee and Brighter Summer Day were a little, you know, intimidating in the sense that I don't know if I want to, uh, my first film from a director to be a three or four hour long movie. And so I saw terrorizers, which is like an hour and 45 minutes. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give this movie a watch. Cause it, it looks really interesting. It has cool, like a, a cool poster. All those things usually attract me to movies. Um, and I watched it and I remember I was just like, like at the end I was like, wow, like I, like I've seen movies kind of like this, but I've never really seen a movie that, I felt like it was done so like like the way he wraps up the story and the way all the characters interconnect is just something that like really spoke to me on uh, a level that I'd say most like ensemble movies that try and do the same thing can't because as you were saying, like also before we started this, like the way the the story develops is very organic. Nothing feels forced and that's kind of like a true theme that i've seen throughout his movies like they're, they're very realistic but at the same time they're very engaging and like i at least get really caught up with the characters and like care about their stories yeah i i, I completely agree with you the nature and pacing of the story i think allows you to build that I'll say rapport, for lack of a better word. I guess connection is probably the best way to describe it. Because you're following them, you feel like you're a part of their everyday life. And I will say this as well. Because you touched on how good of a storyteller Edward Yang is, he is also really, really great at cinematography, which I think also kind of extends to how you said like the poster for Terrorizers is so interesting. Same with Yi Yi Mahjong had a very interesting poster, Brighter Summer Day. That all speaks to his cinematography that you can almost just pull an image straight from his film and it becomes immediately interesting. You want to find out more about it. On top of that, something I really appreciate is that he has a superb strength for having really powerful twists in just about every single film that I've seen from him. And I think one of the films, Brighter Summer Day, has two really big, poignant, impactful moments, and then Terrorizers has it's impactful moment as well. And he, he, he has a formula. I would say you become accustomed to the way he still, he tells stories, but it's so perfectly executed that it always feels fresh when you watch his films. Yeah. I, I just, 
uh, before the podcast today, rewatched Terrorizers kind of in the background because I was thinking about what I was going to talk about. And I was like, I definitely need to watch this again because I, I was so confused at the beginning when I initially watched it. And it did come together for me at the end. But but it's kind of like I needed to like put the puzzle pieces together once again in my head before like in a recent period before I would be able to like articulate what I wanted to say about the movie. So it, it's like, I feel like his films are also definitely ripe for rewatching. Like mm-hmm. if I saw any of the movies I'd seen from him again, I would definitely take away new things. Um, but, but I, you know, I agree completely about his cinematography. I think uh, he's just very good at framing um, his shots, like every single, oh, every single shot basically is like, um, you, you could compare this to a lot of the very artsy European, like French German directors that, that try and make every shot look like a, a painting of some sort or like a, a masterly crafted fo- photograph. I feel like he, he does the same thing, but he kind of has his own touches and I don't really know enough about cinematography to be able to explain what those are, but it's like, it's like for any auteur, like would you watch their movie and when you've seen enough of their films and and like you watch another one, you would probably be able to guess, okay, this is an Edward Yang movie without, you know, someone telling you like he leaves, he has a distinctive mark on the way he shoots his movies. I I completely agree. Uh, One of the only directors I think I could compare him to as far as cinematography goes, and I, I want to preface it as well to say that I find Eastern film to, and especially the ones that, because we cherry pick as a Western audience, obviously we're only going to watch ones that are highly recommended, highly rated, but you do see an eye for cinematography and that a lot of the people who have ascended In the South Korean cinematic movement, the Japanese directors who have movies that withstand the test of time and Edward Yang as well, they have superb cinematography. And it seems like it is a hallmark of that upper echelon Eastern cinema. I would compare him to the director of Chung King express and i'm blanking on his name matt can you help me out with that director's name uh yeah one car Y. yeah and i and and yes i i agree i saw a lot of similarities especially between te pai story and uh one car wise movies and it's it's literally like if you really appreciate that i think that alone will make you love Edward Yang. And it, it, like if if you were trying to look at it maybe from like a student's perspective too, that let's just say there's, you know, down the line I ever had the opportunity to be involved in a film, have any authority in the creative direction, I would point to Edward Yang and I would say what he's doing we should try to emulate in some form or fashion because it it goes really well with his storytelling too and and to your point that you were making it it made me think he kind of has an unassuming style in his storytelling and i think that is why it's ripe for rewatch terrorizers was the first film of his i watched and you really don't have a feel for a director's style yet when when you're watching them for the first time. And it took me about halfway to kind of figure out how everything was coming together because of how unassuming the movie was up to that point. Did you kind of have a similar experience, Matt, as you were watching it? Cause it, I don't know. It's not mundane, but it's slice of life and it kind of feels like you're just going about someone's normal schedule and things kind of fall into place to build towards the bigger storyline. That's how I felt. Did you have a similar kind of experience? 
Yeah, I I feel like he like I guess the it, it's probably the way he films it um, really puts you in the lives of the characters. Um, like you were just saying, I I feel mm-hmm. like like uh, you understand a lot about the characters and and it's not really even through the dialogue it's a lot of the times through the emotions or how he captures them doing certain things um like because because you know i realized after rewatching terrorize today it's like the, the dialogue isn't it's it's not heavy on like figuring out what the movie's about is not heavy on that. It's really on his direction and like where he points the camera and what he chooses to show. And I feel like all of his movies also have this common theme that is really like, especially to pie story, I would say is the one that actually stands out the most on this. Like it creates this feeling of like loneliness in an urban environment. Mm-hmm. I think that it like, he's very interested, I think in telling uh, stories about Taiwan and Taiwanese people. Like he wants to capture, uh, I, th- I feel like people's like souls or their emotions that are living in Taiwan. And I, and I think he, uh, that is truly what he's interested in. like, and he, he's definitely a very philosophical filmmaker, which is why I like him. And I think, yeah, all his stories, like, like while they're different, I, they all go towards in my mind, this goal of like, maybe trying to show people what it's like to live as the, as a Taiwan person in the country, you know? And I think a lot part of that is probably because Taiwanese history is so interesting. You know, the fact that they are split from China and China thinks they belong to them and they have a very sporadic and like, I think violent and interesting history. And I think all those things come into Edward Yang's mind when he's putting these stories together. I completely agree, and I'm really glad you brought that up because you, you're exactly right. And it is integral or a very large aspect of all of the films that I've seen of him so far that that culture is so baked into everything, the story, the shots, everything and you get a really tremendous sense for it and I, I honestly I think the only comparison that I can really make and it, it's the first one that comes to mind but it feels reminiscent of what Scorsese was able to do with Taxi Driver as you're exploring New York City do you kind of d- does that kind of ring true for yeah. you as well Yeah, yeah, because I feel like Taxi Driver is like this story about a type of person that a lot of people can relate to that lived in, I mean, American in general, but also that lived in the city. And like, it's, I guess the best way to explain it is like the fact that he lives in New York is like a very big part of the character himself. And like, you could say the same about these characters, like the fact that they're in Taiwan or in the city or, or growing up in a certain Taiwanese area is like part of who the characters are and like those characters couldn't exist uh like the taxi driver you know his character couldn't exist if he weren't in New York City it's the same for these it's like it's like a it's like a part of the character and he wrote these characters with that in mind and I I think to to kind of go even further out on the branch here so you know, I was talking about Eastern cinema. You get a, I guess, a misrepresentation, me personally, of maybe what I would expect Taiwanese culture to be like f- extrapolating from Japanese culture, which is, I would say, just from Edward Yang's films, he paints entirely different. So, And I know culture shock is kind of used in a different sense, right? But there was a bit of culture shock for me because I had an expectation that uh, the relationships in Taiwan would maybe be more reserved, um, that people would be very, very respectful. Um, Not that they're disrespectful here, but 
it's very much about honor and and being very quiet in Japanese, especially like the older films. Whereas in Edward Yang, you know, there's these sordid affairs. There's tremendous moments of violence. It feels very westernized, I guess, is the best way to, to put it. Yeah, and you know, that might be, and, and I am not like extremely familiar with like Taiwanese or Japanese or Chinese culture, but just from my little knowledge, I know that Taiwan is is definitely like a westernized uh, place, and that's why they're so different than China, and I think that's why China doesn't like them very much, because uh, they're very American. I think they, uh, well, like I think you can go over there like going over there as an American, it's very more Western. I think it would be a little less of a culture shock than if you were to go to like Beijing. And that's just from what I've heard and read sporadically. But I imagine, yeah, their culture, because I think they split when uh, around when China was, was turning communist or like something was happening with their communist party. And I think they split and I'm guessing they split in, a, in an effort to become more Westernized. I don't think they liked the, that kind of Chinese culture. So I imagine, uh, you know, the Taiwanese culture is, is very different and probably more Western. I, I agree. And frankly, the, the, the kind of opening of brighter summer day is really, that was like a learning moment for me as they were kind of, they had like some pre movie fill in to explain, you know, it's early days Taiwan. This is very shortly after almost like a civil war in China where the nationalists fled to Taiwan. And it was really like I felt like that story, like you can take away a lot of like what Taiwan is at the moment of these films, right? And what's life, what life is like through these particular characters. But what I enjoy about A Brighter Summer Day is it it really gives you a feel for the national identity as it was being established. And I think that's a really interesting thing for any film to do. Yeah, and I think that was one of his main points because I don't know if you remember, but... I think the like the s- symbolism of of the radio. I, if I remember right, I think they got the radio when they still lived in China, and it didn't work the whole movie. And at the very end, it does. And I so I th- I think you know part of the movie is maybe somehow about like ridding of their old Chinese culture um, and becoming more Westernized. Like you know I, I'm. Not sure if like because there's obviously, you know, in a brighter summer day, this like way of life that they all live at the school. Like there's there's gangs, there's they're like extremely competitive with each other. Their parents, you know, are very focused on just them doing well in school. Um, And and I feel like maybe part of the the point of the movie was to to show like you were saying, to show what the culture was like at the time they were breaking off and maybe to show how they were like transitioning into a new type of society, like the new cultural identity. I definitely like that a lot. I I like that symbolism and how symbolic it's like the turning of a page. Right. And I can imagine in real life that would be really difficult because you're so used to a certain way of life. And not only it's like a movement that everyone is kind of unofficially signed up for where, you know, you are looking for change by moving there. And you're a part of a lot of people with that like mindedness. And you can certainly feel that. And it pairs really well with the youth of that time, which is primarily what that story focuses on because it's a coming of age story for a lot of those different characters and our main character sir wants to kind of be able to control a lot of the people that he befriends and i think that also kind of speaks to i guess the ideology that they 
as a country were steering away from too. Yeah, yeah, and like in, in addition to that, you know, I was just thinking like the after the the big kind of climax happens or, or the the big fight, which we'll go into later. A lot of it seems to shift focus onto the parents, even like if you remember the dad uh, is getting questioned and 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 like it's very it seems very weird like like it reminds me of uh i don't know like how the kgb in the cold war or something like that so i i feel like he's also you know trying to show in general the youth is obviously his focus but i think he wants to show how everyone in in taiwan at that time period was like changing and how they were affected and and how like i guess a lot of these old values that they had are kind of just like disappearing as this new culture is starting and 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 that's a really really great point too because that feels very much i guess and and i don't know this for sure but i i'm gonna say i don't think i'm wrong on this i would assume that interrogation would not be out of the realm of possibility of something that you could expect in modern day china so not even like back then i would think even today something like that wouldn't be out of the norm and an- another thing that just kind of sparked to my mind is the watch that the mother has in a brighter summer day when we were talking about the symbolism of the radio i think that also is very relevant because it almost gets lost at one point and then at the end obviously something that we'll go into later happens with it and it feels like that is because that watch came from the mother of our main character sir it 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 symbolizes in my mind national identity from where they came from previously and what happens with that is very telling of maybe where the fi- the family stands as the movie finishes yeah, and and I guess last piece, uh, another thing that just came to my mind was um, it's kind of like them, they're trying to hold on to their old traditions like the watch and the radio. At the same time, the movie is called A Brighter Summer Day, which if I'm remembering right, is an Elvis Presley song that they play in the movie. And that, I think, to me, symbolizes like this new Western influence that's that's coming in and changing the way that people act and behave in, uh, in Taiwan. I I agree because I, I, it's supposed to be set. I want to say in maybe the early sixties. So Elvis would be, I would, I mean, that's like pretty, that's still cutting edge as far as like, because he was so scandalous in America in the late fifties that to kind of be listening to his music, Oh, you know, like halfway across the world, I mean, that would be considered, I guess, very cutting edge Western culture to kind of appreciate that type of music, I, w- I would say, I guess. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, that might be the kind of thing that if they were still in China would not be allowed. I agree. I, yeah. I mean, if you think about the backlash that happened in America as Elvis was becoming the huge megastar that he was i can only extrapolate that china would just outright ban it as opposed to just moral outrage um but matt do you want to jump into the terrorizers yeah yeah let's talk about it the terrorizers starts very i mean it's action-packed there's a shootout in a building And by chance, one of our main characters, a photographer, finds the girlfriend of one of the gang members who kind of instigates this whole shootout. And he seemingly maybe obsessed isn't the right word, but he finds her as maybe a muse is a better way to to put it. And their story intertwines with a married couple, one who is a author or an aspiring author and one who works at some sort of business. We can get into that. I'm not sure what his actual position was, but 
again, we'll kind of toss that around in a little bit. And the way that their story intertwines becomes this just really interesting, well-crafted story that ends in a very violent and spectacular fashion at the very end. It was great storytelling, really great cinematography. Matt, when you finished The Terrorizers, kind of what were you left with as a first impression, I guess? I remember I was, uh, like, at the ending at least, I was very, not confused, but like perplexed. Like, it's it's one of those movies where you kind of got to figure it out in your head afterwards. But I, I think the biggest, I guess, thematic thing I kind of took away was it's like really one of those movies about like not uh, maybe not about this, but like this is really something you'll take away. Like another ensemble movie is like the butterfly effect. And it's kind of how everyone's lives can be connected in certain ways and like different choices can uh, like significantly impact what someone else does. And, um, I think you, and everyone's lives are just, are so complicated and intricate that, uh, we often don't realize it. And I think this movie really like shows that, I guess is the best way to say it. It, it, it like made me think a lot about that kind of thing. What about you? I completely agree. I mean, it, it, it's, it's such a simple statement, but it felt really profound the way this movie goes about it. Um, in that everyone that you pass every day has their own inner lives that's just as complex and complicated as yours. And this film, it communicates that in such such a great fashion. And like you said, also how little things can have such a big impact, that plays a vital role in this story. Because the muse that I was referring to, her name is White Girl. Apparently, at least from what I was able to gather watching this, she, you know, she dates a gangster. But also, I guess in her meantime, like prank calls people. And one of her calls leads to the wife, who is an author, to kind of just completely change her way of life. Um the way that those two major things that you touched on were communicated, I don't know if it's ever been better done by anyone else. Right. And it's like, it's not done in a way that I don't know. Cheesy is the best word, but like how, how like sometimes movies will have two like parallel characters. They'll have have two stories and they kind of come together at the end. And then that's how you realize that they're connected is like the way they connect in the storyline. Whereas like here, I thought it was like much more creatively done where like that little like phone call that she's just like making prank phone calls. Cause she's inside, which is like, like to her, that's like a, not, you know, a big deal at all. It's like a very probably small thing. She might not even remember she ever did in her life, but it impacts this other woman in like this crazy way to where, you know, she ends up, becoming more obsessed with, with writing. And I believe writing a novel or a book that like changes her life. And at the same time you see it changing her husband's life, which, you know, at the end uh, evolves into like kind of the finale of the movie. And I think that that way that that organic, like way that the story develops, which it's, it's like not just there to like throw you off as like, as like an M night Shyamalan type of twist. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it, it's like an intricate part of the story. And like the, the point of the story, I feel like is to show you how, like how maybe how it's not exactly like, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble explaining this. It's not exactly like a twist in the sense that it just affects the, the movie and like the viewer. It's like a twist that you, then you see the, what happens because of the twist and you see how that changes so many different things. And then the end, it, it's kind of, the ending isn't like this ending is just uh, to, to surprise you because it's a twist. It's like this ending is like a realistic portrayal 
of what could happen based off like all these little, these different people's choices that just like formulate into this thing that happens. I completely agree with you. It, it just, it feels like the, the first domino, I guess is a, a way to put it. Yeah. Like, like that call that, yeah, the, the prank call starts a set of events that unfold until you get to the entirety of, you know, the, the progress, the destruction, all of that. I couldn't help but think while you were talking that I, I feel like Edward Yang is trying to communicate something and that two of our central characters observe the world through photos and one through like written communication, AKA writes books, narratives. And it's like, you know, one is, I guess, absolutely factual, right? Like you can't create a fictional photo, I guess, unless you like use Photoshop or whatever. And one kind of captures one moment in time Whereas a book, obviously, it's it's how a story progresses. There's an end point and a beginning point. And I think he's, you know, what kind of strikes you with that? I, I feel like he's trying to talk about how different people can kind of observe the world around them, I guess. Yeah, you actually hadn't thought of it in that way but i think you're on to something there i feel like the photographer is uh a, a, like common well like in the movie called uh blow up um there's and peeping tom there's these like different obsessed photographers and they usually get like obsessed with f f f taking photographs of like certain things or certain people and but but like, in terms of, uh, tell tell me your thoughts first because I'm having trouble uh, coming up with something. I I think for well because the photographer is kind of the person who was able to pinpoint the connection. I feel like that speaks a lot to like like how you were talking about that one phone call is the moment in time that kind of sets off the chain reaction. And I think the wife, how she is able to kind of extrapolate a moment much like, I guess you would be, I don't know, inspired, which, you know, like for, for writers, I find like that is probably a huge process in the writing processes. First, inspiration for the story but she's the kinetic energy to kind of make the rest of the story unfold i guess i, I mean that's my just like initial kind of trying to piece together but it almost feels like it it speaks to their personalities as well a lot too yeah, I feel like maybe, and this is just something I thought of now, it's like maybe people's obsessions or their interests, like we watch the, how they all work together and like affect one another because, you know, the photographer becomes obsessed with the girl and the, the wife becomes really obsessed with writing that novel. And then... You know, that leads to all different types of things like the the other scientist. I don't know if he's a scientist, the, the guy she cheats on getting involved. And that kind of brings the gang members involved in, in the story as well. And and so, you know, maybe he's he's trying to say he's trying to like there's some meta theme here about stories and the way stories unfold in reality. And maybe that, maybe, you know, this is another thing I just thought of, but it kind of makes sense. He's trying to say, you know, the way our fiction stories are developed is very, like, informative by our realistic stories. And, you know, people often see their real life as boring compared to, like, a fiction novel. 
but I, I feel like he's saying, you know, real life here is just as interesting, you know, because obviously we love this story that he told. Real life here can be just as interesting as a novel or a picture. And like those are just novels and pictures are just like capturing an essence or a moment of of reality that we are like super in tune with and, and that we care about or that we're obsessed with. I, I I completely agree with you. And what I want to say is like, I feel Edward Yang um, is able to kind of insert a, a piece of himself in all of his films at, you know, whether it be what life is like in Taiwan or for this, like what you were kind of able to get to the, the truth of is that, it does feel like the creative process is kind of being examined and, you know, diced up and looked at through completely different lenses. And I just, I find that really interesting as to how he's able to do that as a storyteller. And I completely agree with you in that the real life story being as interesting or even sometimes maybe more interesting than the fictional story that un- unfolds. And I think that becomes ever apparent, like that split or maybe that parallel rather at the end and how he does that in spoiler alert for the terrorizers. Definitely check that film out if you haven't seen it yet and you've listened this far, but how the husband kind of goes through what seemingly happens at the end of the novel that's written. And then when we get to reality, both feel very, very impactful, but I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like because it's, it's real, like, or at least in the movie universe, him taking his own life feels maybe even slightly more impactful because we know okay, this has really happened now. Right, right. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's kind of two endings to the movie. And that's what I remember being thrown off um, by at least the first time I watched it. And I, it's kind of like he leaves it maybe up to you to decide, you know, which one would be more likely to happen. Because and I guess a, a spoiler warning, but I feel like I, we have to mention this to talk about the movie, but you know, there's one where he, you know, kills her and then there's another where he just kills himself. So, and I could be wrong on this. I thought the first ending where he kills her was ripped straight from the book and that he was thinking of like maybe the poetic justice for lack of a better term of like, I'm going like this tore my life apart. You wrote this book and in doing so you left me. How poetic would it be if I basically enact what you wrote me to be? And the second ending was him choosing instead of doing that. I just, I just want to end my life as instead. And, and I, I feel like that is the reality of the film only because we see, it's almost like there's like a, something goes across the universe. Like the wife jolts out of bed as though like she realized it happened without actually being privy to the knowledge. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, maybe this is just my interpretation, but uh, I guess, you know, in real life, you do see a lot of people like, you know, murdering the people who murder their, their wife if they have an affair or, or whatnot. But I think maybe you were right about that being like the more fiction movie version. Whereas like what would, what would be more likely to happen in reality would be for him to just take his own life and, and that be it. And And this is kind of getting to like real life, not theology, but maybe like philosophy. And I I definitely I want to get your opinion on this because of your background in philosophy. But 
how I've heard others explain it, it's like uh, taking your life is almost if you kind of look at it through a different lens, it's almost as though you are killing the world because we only kind of know the world through our own experience, through our own eyes, our own mind. But the world that you inhabit and the world that you kind of walk through only really exists in your own mind, even though we all share it. So when one takes their own life, it's almost as though they're flipping the switch on that world as well. And it feels like he determined like, you know, the most severe action he could take is the one that he takes in the second ending. Does, does any of that click or what I said? Yeah. Like what it made me think about was, um, this philosopher Camus who kind of is like trying to find like how we have meaning in our lives and like this question he asks, which is interesting, is is basically like why doesn't everyone commit suicide? Like why why do we want to continue living? Like what drives people to not just kill themselves? Which is like it, it, posing it like that, it, like kind of at least made me think like wait a second, like like what like killing yourself is obviously seen as a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing, but what is making people want to continue living? And then like, if you look at it through that lens, you can usually find, okay, you know, I really care about like my family or, or my work or my friends, or basically you name stuff that, that you have that, that gives you meaning in your life. And I, when you're taking your own life, like in the end, you're basically saying, in my opinion, that, your life has lost all meaning. Like there's nothing left for you to live for. And to me, that's very different than if he went and killed her because that would, would demonstrate that he really cares that like, it's extremely meaningful to him because he's got all of this, you know, emotion from it. And he's so upset that, you know, he kills her, but then, you know, he's probably going to end up in jail. He probably will end up killing, killing himself. He wants to continue living. Whereas ending ending your own life is just like a completely different choice. I, I completely agree. I, and I, I, I love the kind of philosophy that you you put into it because I think it rings the most true as to his decision for that choice because i think when you examine that character in particular you can definitely empathize with the fact that he feels very lost and he tries to cling to that relationship and once he has his own i guess failures as a professional he's in denial of that he celebrates as though he got the promotion that he never gets. He has one last, like in that celebration moment with one of his dearest friends, but you can tell that that relationship isn't as meaningful because they hadn't really communicated in so long. And the only thing that really brought them together was he asked that police officer friend to kind of, I guess, spy or, investigate his wife so he, he feels as though there's nothing less for him as a character as an observer so i i think the way that you kind of broke it down is a really interesting kind of tidbit and i think it gives a lot of information to that character in particular yeah because the movie you know all throughout the movie like you were saying his character is kind of just like diving into like, like his life is, is basically falling apart on every end of his life is, is falling apart. And like, that is probably what he had found meaning in beforehand. You know, his wife, I, I remember the part where they were planning to have a kid. And I think that's what got her to be depressed. And, you know, that's a lot of the times I, I feel like that's, that's what happens. I, I, I know you've seen um, 
I, I believe you've seen that Manchester by the Sea, and I watched mm-hmm. that movie recently too. That I think has another, like a similar theme of well, his his life has already fallen apart in that movie, but but you kind of just see how these people start going through life and like this, they they find no meaning or joy in anything anymore after like all everything that made their life meaningful has fallen apart. And I think that's kind of like the, the essence of his character. And I feel like he is kind of the main character. Um, and, and a, a lot of the butterfly effect things that happen in the movie go back to really affecting him significantly. And so it's like all these different people, their actions, whether they realize it or not, or whether they meant to or not end up hurting him and, and really damaging his life in the end. Yeah, and as you were kind of describing that, and, you know, right now I'm, I'm looking at the, basically the poster for the film, and, I'm, and, and, and what kind of spurred it was you talking about the, 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 the businessman being the main character, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, how can we kind of take this examination? We're looking at him to the photographer. And and I think it kind of stems back to how we were talking about maybe the difference of, you know, an author, a photographer, but also the similarities too, because it seems like from one photo, this photographer creates this kind of imaginary person that he falls in love with. And, and maybe that too speaks to what Edward Yang is trying to tell the audience is that there's similarities too. you know, I originally only looked at it like trying to compare and, but well, mostly just contrast actually, but I guess it compounds how we think about the inner lives of others. And also I guess how much of that, can be also just in the minds, like the, the inner dialogue of a person, what maybe what they're going through in reality doesn't quite match up with, with how they're interpreting their lives or maybe these fantastical things that they're coming up with that they want to achieve in the future or, you know, someone that they love that they never met. It it just, it makes these characters feel fleshed out in a way that, it, it just never really happens in other films. I mean, you get full characters when a, a really good director does something, but you really get an essence for what these characters minds are like. And that I think is what makes this film really, really special. Yeah. I think the, the photographer, I, I, and that's kind of what I was saying at the beginning, how there's like not even a lot of dialogue, but you get this sense, you get the sense of who they are a lot more than other movies. You get this sense of like who the photographer is just because the, the way he idolizes this woman and like literally takes the apartment he initially photographed her in to be like his, his dark room where he processes his photos it just turns into this like all consuming obsession. And it is, it, it, he shows that it's really built up in his mind by the fact that, that when he actually interacts with her, it's like not as grand and like great as he thought it would be. And I, I think that's extremely true for a lot of people. You know, we, we, I know we talked in the podcast a lot about like celebrity worship and, and idolizing people through the various different movies we've watched. But I, I feel like you get a very good sense of like, this is what from this movie, like this character is really idolizing this girl. And then when he meets her in reality, it's not anything like he expected. And I think um, going back to also what we were just saying before, that's like the way he create was creating meaning in his life. Like people like he's thinking, okay, if I just, uh, can it's not even like he wants to just date this woman it's like he wants to be um like completely enthralled and like obsessed and super caught up in in her image and like he takes something from her that's that she it's not really there at all like 
and he uses that uh, as a purpose. And I think that's also probably common for a lot of photographers. I think a lot of good photographers get obsessed with certain types of images and then that just like takes over their mind. And that's like what gives them meaning in their inner life. Do you think that maybe like finally meeting white girl, the, the, the kind of subject of the photographer's main photo, the huge collage that he makes. Do you think that I'm trying to think of how to word it, but like he was, I think there was, like you said, like some disappointment, but that maybe he wishes it never happened at all. And that he could just kind of, worship her idolize her from afar or love her from afar i guess like do you even think maybe before he met her like that that was something he just kind of wanted to perpetuate and that meeting them was always something in his own mind that he he felt would maybe break this imaginary world that he had built up yeah, you know, maybe so because I feel like the fantasy is more important to him than the reality. And something I just thought, maybe that plays into the the double ending where like her novel is like a fantasy and that's how it kind of plays out in her mind. Like she that's like her fantasy is like he would come and and kill her cuz he cares so much and about it. Maybe that's kind of linked, but but yes, I, I do see what you're getting at with that. I love how you tied that into the ending because I, I definitely think that that sparks a thought. And and this is, you know, kind of like just real, real world, like psychological take that I want to get your opinion on. And without really having any backing for this obviously i can't speak to this from personal experience but there can sometimes be an undercurrent with taking one's own life for this specific scenario it it almost feels like a venge there's there's a bit of vengeance with that and that sometimes that vengeance can be the like you know the final straw the 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 spurred lover and i feel like the film does a really good job communicating that if if you look at the first ending kind of giving you that motivation does does that kind of make sense at all like th- that's edward yang's way of telling us that for him it is personal in taking his own life that in his mind, she is specifically destroyed with the rest of the world that ends with him. D- does that make sense? I don't know if I explained that really well. Um, I'm having a, can you try and explain it one more time? So kind of like the, the theory I was like- trying to, to paint the picture for, Like if I if I were to take my own life, the way I have every relationship mapped in my brain and the person that like you are in my Mm -hmm. mind or like my girlfriend is in my mind in a way dies when I die. Right. It felt like Mm -hmm. there was kind of the motivation that his wife in his mind was someone he like especially wanted to kill when he killed himself. Do do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. She exists in his mind because like that relationship, those conversations they had, the way he specifically sees her only exists with him. And when he goes, that specific person that he thinks her to be also kind of dies in a way. I see what you're saying. And I see now how you're tying it kind of to the the photographer. You could say the same thing about the photographer 
except the difference is when he meets her in his mind, it, it kind of destroys that initial fantasy. Is that kind of what what you're saying? We, well, I, 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 I didn't really put that together myself, but from what like you putting that together, I completely agree. I, it's it's very much the same thing. Yeah, so maybe yeah, I kind of see what you're getting at here. Like, it and it would connect with the theme of like everyone having their, which I think you know is the main thing. Everyone having their own super complicated lives that you know they often don't realize how like often other people could look like an NPC to you or Mm -hmm. just like make an easy reference. But like the reality is, is that they're not at all. They probably just have just as complex of of a life as you do even without you realizing it. So yeah, when he, maybe when he does kill himself at the end, it's, it is in an effort to like, like that's his way of like getting back at her or erasing her from his mind. Cause I don't think he would be able to, do it with with like if he had killed himself i don't think it doesn't seem like his character would be able to go on living normally with all that stuff collapsing around him and i guess you could parallel it to the same thing with with the photographer and and the the white girl is that when he finally meets her it kind of all collapses the fantasy in his head of of what what he thought white girl would be like so yeah i do kind of see um a, a connection there and and i do i do understand what you're saying and i think it's an interesting idea he's kind of by by making that choice he is like he's like ridding of he, he's getting rid of her essentially and i guess by the photographer meeting her even though he doesn't really realize it himself he is kind of getting rid of her like i imagine he would he's no longer obsessed with her after he meets her. And I think, I mean that like there's some symbolism there too, in that white girl after meeting and sleeping with the photographer tries to steal, I think most of his cameras. And I think as like kind of a goodwill, like, you know, like thing leaves one camera, but I think it's supposed to just, kind of symbolize what you had been talking about. It's like the way he views the world is changed now. Yes, yes, exactly. And I, and, and, you know, the way the husband views the world is, is, is changed. And I think the wife even too, it's like, I think maybe the wife's side of this whole thing is that she lost or or she wasn't able to have a, a, a child. And I think that kind of, like caused her to lose meaning in her life herself. And the way she's getting it back is through writing this novel. Right. It's she, she's finding the meaning that she so desperately wanted and touching back on, on one of the points and just to like, like even the person who thinks they know you the best, same with me, how we look at ourselves and who we find to be our true inner selves probably varies from that image. And I don't think there's any way to like truly fully know that like you can get a really clear picture of who someone is, but that will never entirely match who a, they interpret themselves to be, or maybe also to what their, their essence is. You can never fully know who someone is. And I think that point gets beat, not beat into the ground, but I think it's touched upon numerous times through dialogue. Um, especially when you look at the wife, because in the arguments with the husband, she always says kind of like, paraphrasing but you you don't get me like you you don't understand yet after all this time we've been together and you still don't get me and and that touches upon the fact that who she is in her heart just doesn't match anymore what the husband i guess maybe wants her to be 
or has her in his mind as. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think, um, that, that is definitely a theme of this movie and it, cause it, it definitely ties back in with, you know, everyone's, what I was saying about everyone's life so complicated, you can't really know. And even someone's wife, even if you've known them for years, I feel like they don't, they, they cannot completely understand you at all times. You can only understand yourself. And a lot of that's because people are constantly changing, thinking of different ways, developing new ideas, like deciding to write a novel or deciding they want to take on this, this new activity. And I think that's why a lot of times, you know, when people say they split up from their, their partners, it's because they'll they'll say something like we just like grew apart. And I think Mm -hmm. that is what has happened in this movie. And I think that, that like uh, all of that, you know, is, is kind of part of the, the big theme. And I guess it's, you know, I know I, I've said this multiple times already, but I guess it's just the fact that you can't ever really know someone at a certain period of time. You never know what people are thinking. You never know what you say or do. You never know how what you say or do is going to affect someone else. Um, and, 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 you know, you, you like, I'm sure a lot of people thought, you know, he was upset that uh, with his, his job issues and with his marriage. But I, I would bet you, you know, if this were a real life scenario and not a movie and you asked people after he committed suicide, almost all of them would say he didn't seem like he was going to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that kind of, you know, he didn't seem like he was going to do this. And that's just because people are no one goes around telling everyone their inner thoughts all the time and and i think that like inner thoughts is kind of like the motivator for all these characters and and maybe that's a little bit why the the movie's a little confusing is because you have to yourself figure out what they're thinking and and, because it doesn't tell you and then only after you watch the movie do you figure out um how everything's connected and how like different people's inner worlds and their motivations like end up affecting everyone else in these like very strange ways, which is exactly what happens in reality. And I think that's part of the brilliance of this movie is like, this is, you know, maybe a, it's still a film, but it, it, it's a definitely displays a very real part of, of reality for pretty much everyone that lives on earth. I completely agree. And I think it's such a tough and difficult subject matter to try to explore as a film and for Yang to just absolutely hit it out of the park and do it so well speaks to how impressive a an artist, I'll say, he is. I One, I, I kind of want to pivot to one of the characters that we've definitely mentioned a lot, but we haven't really explored and i think there is a lot to extrapolate from white girl the the woman who is photographed by the photographer i find her to maybe be the toughest nut to crack and that's kind of why i haven't really dove into exploring her character but what what say you kind of about her essence what did you get from her? Because, you know, you, you get maybe a, a sneak peek by the fact that, you know, she feels so bored at home and is kind of just looking for the action, for lack of a better term, because she's dating a kind of a gangster. I mean, what do you think her role in this this all is? Obviously, she plays a vital role in the photographer story, but I guess what's her story? I mean, have, have you any thoughts on, on her as a character? You know, it's actually really funny because, because one of the things I was going to ask you is that exact same question, but I will, will, cause I was thinking myself, like what? I wonder what, like the, what her, what is her role or point in the movie? Like I, obviously she plays a role in like connecting these characters together, but like her herself, I can't really figure it out, but I'll, 
I'll give it my best shot. I mean, I think that, you know, because there's the whole aspect that I believe her dad is like an American soldier. And that's why she's white, because she's like half white. Um, you know, and then she's very lonely. I mean, my an initial thought after just thinking about it for a second was that maybe she represents, well, you could say this about the photographer too, because he seems lonely, but she seems to represent like, to me, loneliness, like someone who, like in my mind, she would be the type of character that got caught up in the gang, not because she is a, a violent person, like intrinsically, but because maybe she was raised in a type of place where, she had to do these kinds of things to get by. And that just kind of became part of who she was. And that she seems like she might like, and maybe this is partly because the way the photographer like takes images of her and kind of idolizes her. It makes her seem like she's this like kind of greater than, than normal human. But to me, she uh, seems like she like, inside she's like a good person but she is lonely and like stuck in this this city or this place uh with these people that she doesn't really care for all that much and so you know like she just does things like steal from people that might like her because she thinks there's like there's no future with this person anyways kind of like a uh you know, like like someone you would see nowadays that maybe like a a, a thief, homeless person. They they don't like someone that doesn't trust other people in the area, and so they're just always looking out for themselves. And it's not necessarily because they're evil; it's because they feel like that's what they need to survive. And I could be stretching this conception like big time, and it could be completely wrong. But I would like to know what you think. Well, you you brought something up, and it and it kind of something clicked into place. I will preface it with the same thing that you ended with is that I might be stretching this way out from maybe what the vision was when this was, you know, being written and, but you bringing up her father, I I have to think plays a big impact. Like she feels spontaneous. She feels a bit like a lost soul, but I feel like, you can kind of look at everyone else's motivations and and boil it down. And for her, I think why it's so kind of hard to grasp or kind of put your finger directly on is I think as a character, she kind of wants to be, she likes chasing a concept of love or attachment or belonging that in the back of her mind, she will never truly catch. And I think that's why she likes being with the gangster, because I feel like a character like that is also manipulative and someone that you would call like it, someone who maybe just uses white girl as opposed to actually maybe giving her the love and affection that like a, a normal person would want. And I think that stems from the fact that she has an absent father. So it's like she's in inadvertently kind of recreating the the loss or you know, void that she had as a child. And I might have taken that way further than what the vision was, but that's what came immediately to my mind when, when you brought that up. Yeah. I think, you know, it's one of those movies where both of our conceptions could be right. Cause I think they both come from the same place. Like the absent father, like this, this happens in real life, you know, when people, when people, have like, I would call it a void. They, they would turn to doing these like self-serving things or hanging out with certain people to try and fill that void. Like as an example, I think off the top of my head, like a lot of like gang members are in gangs because they don't really have a family. Like they grew up without, um, you know, a father figure or a mother figure or 
any father and mother figure at all. And so they're trying to find a sense of belonging somewhere. And I feel like she is someone who just can't, who doesn't really find it. Like, I just think of the scene where she's like bored and, and making those prank phone calls. It just seems like she just kind of has an aimless life. And for her, maybe they're, maybe she doesn't really have much of a meaning. Like we've been talking about the meaning of all these characters. And so she just kind of drifts um, and doing different things. And, you know, she, she, maybe she wouldn't care if she got arrested or shot. It would really bother her. And I think the inclusion of a character like that is important. Just the acknowledging that there are people like that in the world as you're exploring these very, very complex characters with very complex inner lives that not like she's like an empty vessel, but that there's kind of people who just go through life by the seat of their pants, you know, like they just see opportunity, they take it, they, they kind of just talk like, and and they'll say whatever's at the top of their mind, but I, you know, it's, I, I feel like that inclusion is trying to say like, there are people like this as well, I guess. Yeah. It's like, she's searching something to fulfill that, that void that she has of, of not having really much meaning. And, you know, by, by searching for that, she's just kind of drifting in this lonely state of mind through this, uh, through this city, which, you know, is another big theme in like drifting through cities in a lonely way is definitely a big theme of like Yang's films. Yeah. And, and like a lot of directors have been able to capture this and Yang does it very, very well is being able to portray the loneliness in a setting where you're kind of, you know, you're surrounded, but he does it really well in that he sometimes it almost makes the city feel empty with some of his shots. Yeah. And, and one, another thing that just came to mind is like, she provides, she kind of provides until they meet, you know, she provides so much meaning to this photographer like unbeknownst to her, she's doing all this. And at the time, like she means the world to him. Um, but he doesn't even know her. I think that's just like an interesting like facet of this. And I don't really know if there's much you could take away from that as like a conclusion, but I think that's good because I remember the end with, when she leaves, um, I think those, the bureau, like parts of the bureau, like flutter off, and they kind of like break off and it's kind of like his fantasy with her is concluded. And she like provided something for him where him as a character, the photographer as a character in 20 years is going to look back and, and he might barely, ev- he, he might not even care so much about the encounter of meeting her, but he might really idolize who he thought she was before he ever met her. Does that make sense? No, I, I completely agree. And in the way the characters kind of treated for the majority of it, 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 it kind of like it speaks to the the fact and fiction of of a person. You know, it's like she she made these like concrete impacts on the the wife and the photographer based on the assumption of them kind of thinking she's someone other, like someone else. But once they, like she was finally met, she could like to the person who met her, the photographer, she couldn't live up to that expectation in his mind. And it kind of makes you wonder like, how would things have changed for the author slash wife? If she would have met white girl, and know that that's the person on the other side of the phone. I think that's just like another really interesting facet of what Edward Yang explores with like who we perceive people to be, how they are perceived and who someone truly is. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it's very interesting talking about this movie because like we have like kind of extrapolated how all these characters like, mean stuff or or help or make others derive meaning in their life like they provide it or take it away and you can kind of like link 
even though it's it's not like told to you in the movie that these these characters are doing this with with like they're taking meaning from other people they don't know or they're or or and all that like it doesn't tell you that but you could take away all this from the movie which i think is what what makes it so great i agree um and and just like full transparency most of this stuff that we kind of extrapolated together didn't even really occur to me as I was watching it. And yet I found the story to just be so interesting with the cinematography, how the story was told that I still really, really liked it. And I think with all this extra layers and extra meaning, it makes the film feel even more poignant and even more, I don't know, important, but maybe so, because I don't think it, this is something that people are aware of, maybe even in the back of your mind. But it's so easy to kind of lose that and and forget about that. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, almost everyone has, you know, in real, like uh, I think it's called like um, protagonist syndrome, like everyone mm-hmm. has that to a certain extent where everyone kind of sees themselves as the main character in their life. And, and a movie like this, like I was the same as you, I wasn't thinking about any of this stuff when I finished the movie, I was just kind of like trying to piece it all together in my head. And I thought, you know, this is a super interesting story and the way it was told was very interesting. But uh, when you really like delve into the themes and like the meaning of the movie as a whole, you, you, for me, that's what I take away is like, I guess like the cliche thing to say would be like, you know, any little, any little thing you do can, can affect anyone else in life. So always, you know, make the right decision or something like that. But that, that like cliche kind of saying is kind of the meaning of the story. And, but, but like the, the movie is not, it, it doesn't wrap that message up for you so cleanly. Like I, I guess most movies would, it kind of like you have to figure that out on your own and you have to like dive into the meaning of the movie and like how all these stories and characters are connected in order to, to like figure out uh, um, how, how they all connect. And I think that, that the fact that you have to do that is what makes this movie so special because I think it reflects, like I've said earlier, like it reflects reality better than a, a nice nicely like tied up story where they kind of explain to you here's how all these characters are connected you know and real life stories are not so wrapped up and nice and easy like that they are complex like this movie and to figure out how other people are infecting or affecting your life or figuring out if you're like obsessing over a celebrity or you're idolizing someone like you don't like those things don't become apparent to you in reality, unless you really like, you know, I don't know through therapy or through like inner monologues and through like figuring out who you are, you, it it takes a lot of effort to figure these kinds of things out. Just like, I think it takes a lot of effort to come to these conclusions about the movie. Yeah, I I completely agree. Uh, Matt, I want to ask you, what is your, initial rating i guess once like after you finished this film and then any final thoughts on the terrorizers my initial rating was a four out of five um i love this movie um it might be deserving of a four and a half after this conversation um i i guess my only other thought would be i think this is a great one to start with for uh yang probably of the three i've seen of him um my my favorite it would be the best starting place i would say um and and if i hadn't seen a a brighter summer day this would definitely be my favorite one um i i just think the the whole thing the script the cinematography to the story how everything about this movie is brilliant i i gave this a 4.5 out of 5 and I just want to emphasize what you said 
I agree. I think the Terrorizers is the best place to start for Edward Yang. In my self ranking of like all of my favorite films, so everything I gave a 4.5 or 5, I have Yi Yi just slightly ahead of the Terrorizers. But even as I was kind of ranking them in my mind, I was like, I think there's like you could make a terrific argument for either of these to be better than the other and like, you know, rightfully above the other. So I, I just kind of taking that into why I think it's the best film. I think it's really deep. You get the essence of like how deeply thematic Yang can be from this film. And I think having the story unfold over a shorter period of time it allows you to kind of digest all of the things that Yang can throw at you. Because I think if perhaps if you start with Yi Yi, it might just be kind of too much to consume as you're also trying to figure out like how he tells a story, which is very, very unique. Matt, I'm really, really excited to talk about a brighter summer day because kind of, to the point that I was getting at previously, this is a story that unfolds over the course of basically four hours. So this is just ripe for a discussion. It's a film that follows primarily a family with Sir being the main kind of character of that family. And you also get his school and personal life involved and how gangs are very prevalent because as we're kind of told at the onset of this, because it's a new nation, a lot of people, mostly young people would look to gangs kind of for protection as the nation is kind of gaining its identity. And through following this story, you get a really kind of full picture of sir the main character and and he ultimately has a very very large impact on the people around him matt what was your kind of initial thoughts when you finished a brighter summer day my initial thoughts i was just like amazed at how he can bring so many characters together into a story and me be interested and actually like e even though a lot of the characters you know were not very good people i ended up liking and caring for almost all of them and they all really like stuck out as like so in so much individual like like they truly were real people individuals in the story whereas i feel like a a lot of movies, other side, uh, like they would just be a side character, like they wouldn't be fully developed. But I think a lot of it is because he has this four-hour runtime to to develop everything. Um, so, so I think I was just so amazed by how it's kind of like in the Terrorizers, how I how I talked about how he can. It's kind of like a puzzle movie, and it and it can all come together at the end, and and that understanding is uh like really cool to me the fact that you know i i can bring all these things together and like un and understand how they all connect whereas in this movie there is of course that as well but to me it was also like you see how these characters it's like you're watching these characters develop in real time and like go through these like identity crises um and and you're you're kind of I, I guess it's also because of the length. I think the length is extremely important to this movie. I think it makes me feel like I'm like really in the movie. And uh, so I think like the main thing about my initial thought would be like, I was like, wow, that was like, that really was a journey. And I felt like I was like taking a trip, really taking like a, an actual trip through the life or the lives I should say of these Taiwanese people during this time period. And I think that's exactly what Edward Yang intended for this movie. Yeah. I, I was just so impressed with the, I mean, this just felt like the absolute best piece 
that Yang has put together. And, you know, I've I've only seen five of his films and ultimately he wasn't able to make a ton before he passed away. But um, like from Mahjong story to. Wait, no, just Mahjong Taipei story, then you get Yi Yi. And obviously the last one we talked about, the terrorizers, like to me, this just felt the most interesting. There was no lulls. And to be able to accomplish that over the course of four hours where you have a ton of canvas to fill was just the thing that I was kind of in awe of by the time this finished. And I, I feel like he kind of broke this one up into like by the halfway point, you you almost get a full story just from that. And then you have an entire second part because there's there's almost kind of a mid film climax to this. And we'll kind of get more into that. But I just I really, really liked the pacing of this film. And I felt like it was the best paced film of Edward Yang. Any thoughts on that, Matt? Yep. I had the same thoughts after the, you know, the big, like you just call it the samurai sword fight in the middle of the movie. I was kind of expecting it to be over because, you know, that's kind of what the whole movie was leading up to. But then you've got at least maybe an hour, an hour and a half more of film after that. And it's not just like a resolution because the, Surprisingly to me, they, they don't even mention that event very much. Um, it's just kind of like life goes on and you kind of, it, it's, it's to me, it's like you see a, a pre as if I know that these are just kids, but it's like you're seeing before a war or something like a, a culture before and after a war. Cause you see, you know, how different things are like, like, one thing I think of is that ice cream parlor, I believe it is with the very, it's a very cool looking shop with like pink and blue colors that they meet at. And you see after when he goes to meet Sly there, when the main character does like how it's empty and no one goes there anymore. And that, and I think the second half is very impactful because it's just kind of shows you that theme of like times have changed, times are changing, which is another, you know, big thing that I think Yang wanted to say in this movie. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's as though like the transformations of the characters are mirroring that of the nation as a whole or or the culture as a whole. And you touched upon that as we were kind of just diving into this podcast and it, it didn't really strike me before, um, but I think it, I think it really rings true because despite like not being able to take away that notion myself when watching it, like many of his other films, you totally get the you, you get a kind of a full serving of what it is like in every setting that he kind of uses for his films. You, you get what Taipei is like, you get what that time period is like And this being a different time period than the other films I had seen. It's unique for that. And also because it's very historically relevant and to kind of have that portrayed by the characters at large without every 20 minutes saying like, okay, well like this is also what's happening during the year. It's just like really, really creative and really well executed. Yeah. And, and and I think like terrorizers, you know, this is something I I love in films that I feel like it's realistic. Mm -hmm. Like um, I, I feel like the, especially the way the kids like, you know, gang up, into into groups and fight each other like that is something that i mean i i experienced when i was little and you know i uh, i was you know grew up in a perfectly affluent neighborhood but i still have several memories you know of i when i was in scouts like people would kind of 
get into groups and like fight each other with with sticks and i mean it well you know no one was like hurting each other but it was like it was like this drive i remember kids had when we were little to like to to get into groups and like battle other people and i i also remember in middle school when i was in um football like in middle school there was like people just created basically you could call it gangs i guess like just for fun and and they just wanted to like join a group and fight another group because they thought it was entertaining. And so I think the whole like youth, like wars that they kind of had on each other is very realistic. And I could see this. And I think it was based on a true story based on the ending when they said how sir, I think got like 25 spent like 15. He spent some time in prison. They say he got released. I wouldn't be surprised if this was based on, true events that Yang maybe experienced himself. Yeah. When I, you know, before I got to the end, this felt like just so realistic. I honestly thought it was Edward Yang, like telling his life story through sir. Uh, Did you get that impression too? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought it was at first, but then at the end I thought, oh, maybe Sir is a is like someone he knew. Right, yeah, because, I mean, obviously, like you said, he goes and he says like his, his sentence had been, I think, commuted basically, like he was, or that they argued over it because like the nation was kind of so new, they didn't really have a standard, okay, this is what you get for... I don't want to give the crime away, but, um, yeah, I, it, up to that point, I was kind of like, this feels so not just realistic, but so personal. Like you're, you're getting such a individualized view through all these characters, but especially sir that, you know, to be able to do that for any character, I just thought, you know, maybe he's going from personal experience, I guess. But that aspect definitely makes this film feel very special from that standpoint as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's also so many other characters that I feel like you get a really good grasp of who they are and that they were probably based on real people. Like the dad was probably based on his dad that Ming was and actually ended up being a very fleshed out character and, and like very interesting character as well. And, you know, even some of the side characters, you kind of see how they all develop and they become friends and they become enemies and they fight one another in, in, in a similar way to the terrorizers. It all feels like it's like developing organically. And like, this is something that he, he took out of his own life. Like it's kind of like an autobiography. Yeah, you touched upon it, too. When you said how there's a ton of other characters fleshed out, I mean, my mind went immediately to Ming. And and I find and it, it's no mistake, I think, that she becomes so integral to the story, especially at the end. But she's a bit of an enigma, too, because much like terrorizers who us, the audience and who also sir thinks her to be ends up being wildly different once all the facts are kind of like in full view of both characters i you know because we just talked about that kind of same perspective i didn't want to dive into it but i i do think that that same kind of thematic essence that is in terrorizers. I think you can kind of use that a lot in a brighter summer day as well. Yeah. Like for example, I felt like, you know, coming from sir's perspective, Ming was the one that wronged him. You know, it seems like she's going around getting with all these guys as like a game. But I think in reality, by the end, you realize that Ming is just, like she she's just she, she wants to like befriend people and she like when people are young you know they get into different romantic relationships like this and i feel like the like the guys just kind of 
see Ming as like this prized girl, like, okay, if you can get this girl, like you're the top dog. And so like everyone is trying to get with her and she's kind of just like ends up being this object that people want to claim. And you, and so that's like what she kind of seems like most of the movie, because the movie you're really getting the perspective of the, the boys and especially sir. But I, you know, obviously what happens at the end and, and, and that stuff, I, I feel like it's not like sir would want to say it was her fault. Mm-hmm. Whereas just like in the terrorizers, it's like, a myriad of different things all coming together. And she just happened to be like this weird object of desire for these people. And, and, and yeah, it's, I feel bad for her at the end, essentially. Whereas like most of the movie she's painted as, um, like this girl who's trying to, um, not get sir in trouble, but like, she's going to get him in trouble because she's, connected to all these other people that if they see Ming with Sir, they're going to go beat Sir up. And, and you know, it's in the midst of the movie, you kind of see her as bad, but in the end it kind of, sh- I think the movie showed me that it was, it was not her fault. It was the fault of all these people. It was the fault of like the, the same perspective that brought these people to fight each other and like to, it, like they want to win is like the the main goal and like winning means in part like claiming Ming as like your your girlfriend um and i so i think that was a very like interesting aspect of of you know basing like like it's found in real life all the time and it's it it, it seems pretty realistic the way it plays out in the movie uh, but yet it's extremely interesting and at the same time it it definitely feels like a movie because because when you're watching it all, it's very entertaining, and it's not as boring as reality would seem, even though it's definitely derived from reality. Right, I, you and you, you kind of brought up like a theory that not a theory, but an idea that I find really interesting when it comes to Ming, and then I kind of want to talk about maybe something that I think deeply inspires her in her psychology. But like you said, we kind of see it all the time. Sometimes it's like the perceived value of a, a woman can be derived from the fact that others want them. And does that make sense? It's like the demand placed upon a person as like a, like wanting to date them inflates their value in the minds of others around them. And I feel like Ming is like a perfect example. And I think honestly, if anyone listening to this and you as well, Matt, like you can probably think, especially in high school or in college where you have like a very close knit community where it's, it's like kind of easy to derive like, Oh, so-and-so likes X. And because of that, maybe in your mind or the minds of others, like the value of that person goes up slightly because they see something in her and maybe, well, that must mean there's something to see in them, if that makes sense. And then like the, the, the second point is that I think the fact that Ming's mother has so many, not so many, but she has an ailment of like being very severely, seemingly asthmatic And the mom wanting to kind of put the pressure on Ming that one, you have to grow up fast. And I think that's honestly an exact quote from the film that she probably has to start like her life as a and in this culture. I mean, that means a family and that means you have to have like a husband as well. And it seems like she's just trying to like fast track her life and that's why she seemingly kind of bounces in and out of different relationships because she's probably trying to like you know get to that part of her life faster than the others around her yes it's it's like for the first thing you said i i think that's right i think that they 
they don't even like Ming as much as they like the idea of having her and how that would evoke respect to like the opposing group or people who they seem to be like competing with. And yeah, I feel like maybe, you know, Ming, Ming is having good intentions and she wants to find a boyfriend that, you know, she, cause she's thinking about marriage already, you know, cause like you said, she's trying to grow up fast. Whereas like, like all the guys that she's with, and this, you know, happens in, reality all the time as well or they don't see her that way at all they just see her as this like prize possession they see her as like if i get her these guys will respect me whereas she and from her mind they think she thinks that they really you know like her as a person whereas in reality they might not even really be listening to her when she's like telling them about herself they are in their mind they're thinking how can i how can i like conquer this this girl how can i get her for myself i need to like put on this act like uh, act these certain ways to impress her i shouldn't act like my real self and actually get to know her on a personal level so i think you know that is one of the the many themes in this movie that i think uh, stood out to me and when it comes to kind of growing up fast, I, and I think we would both agree on this, that it feels like, well, for one, Ming is in eighth grade, if I remember correctly. And then in the end, you end up finding out that she kind of had like a relationship with one of the doctors at the school, which is just kind of insane to to think about. And that certainly speaks to the fact that you know, growing up fast, kind of diving into aspects of life that maybe are better if they just like come naturally as opposed to just like speed running through those aspects of life. But that is very much the case of all of the kids. I mean, being involved in these gangs because um, they eventually take like form as legitimate gangs like you said the the kind of samurai fight and all of these like physical scraps or fights that end up happening like i think to your point to me the first thing that comes to mind is like i think the national identity that it's like you know we just were kind of in a conflict so you're very much aggressive with your ideology and you have to kind of like form everything really fast because, I mean, everything like the, the country of Taiwan could fall apart if you don't kind of like get your shit together very quickly as a country. I, I kind of see a parallel there, but obviously because you brought it up first, but. I think it does speak to that. These young kids trying to grow up fast because they're in an environment that kind of mirrors themselves as a country. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, for me, how I was saying earlier, how I was relating the whole, you know, gang and uh, gang thing, how, how kids like to get into groups and fight each other. I, I was relating it to my own experiences, you know, it obviously never really got that serious. So in the movie, when they literally start, you know, killing each other and stuff like these, these crazy things are happening. I was just, that was the moment in the movie. I was so shocked. And I, I guess it's kind of like a climax, but it really left a big impact on me. Cause like, I was sad too. I was like, how are these kids doing this to each other? And, and it's, like, 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 I thought maybe they would go in with like fake swords and fight, but I didn't think they would actually go. You know, you know what? What I don't think what happened would would have actually happened in the movie. Um, but I think like what you were saying is is true. I think these they represent like because uh, I, I read this review and I didn't get this from the movie, and I'm sure it says it, but I I think the little park boys are actually a group uh, that's like the children of 
like native Thai- Taiwanese civil servants, and the two seventeens are sons of like K and T military officers, and so it's like these groups represent, I think, the different interests of the country at the time, like like th- these two, you know, because when a country splits from China and they like create their own new nation, you're gonna have competing interests for what they want the country to to look like and they how they want people to act you know it's it's very hard to merge two cultures together because cultures act extremely differently you know it's like when you go to another country this is obviously a completely irrelevant kind of example but like i don't tip at a restaurant in europe like people act completely differently there's different ways of doing things and and i think at least from my experience just in life you get the the biggest like most violent and most severe and kind of crazy conflicts all across the globe whenever you have two cultures that are like trying to uh, that are saying this is like my land it need we need to do things this way and then you have another culture saying no like these are this is really our land like and we do things this way and so everyone needs to act this way and like that is i think like, like this battle even though uh, like you don't really you it, it, you don't really see that exactly playing out because i feel like it's the the boys are more representative of um the of the culture but like i think that's kind of a big theme like a meta theme that i kind of took away from this movie yeah I, and i think it's a really it's a really interesting way and it kind of reframes everything. If you look at this movie through that lens of it's like a, a microcosm of the nation as a whole and really, really interestingly done. And there's these very big larger than life characters who are kind of born through this story one that that comes to my mind that I kind of want to talk about because I feel like he's a person I don't fully understand, but there's a lot of meat on the bone for him. And that's honey because he's only in the film for such a, a short period of time, but he's almost he's referred to a lot when he doesn't when he has not yet made his kind of debut in the film. So I, I kind of want to try to understand what he's representative of because he's a larger than life kind of the big boss man of the the gang that Sir is in. And then he kind of before you know it, like he shows up and then he's gone. Um, what were your kind of thoughts on Honey? To me, I am. I feel the same way about Honey. Honey was a character I wanted to discuss, and I think he was one of the most interesting characters as well. I see him like, and and I I know you'll you'll get what I'm talking about when I say this. He's like, you know, when you're a kid, and people are talking about this really cool older guy that has done all these things, or he's accomplished certain things that that you think are, are cool or like he's like the guy that, that everyone respects like a, like a Scarface or like a, the, the head honcho. And that is, is like as a kid, like I feel like you idolize those types of characters even more. And when he comes into the film, uh, cause I believe he's known, like they say, Oh, he killed like the, the two one seven boss or something like that. And so when he comes back into the film, it's kind of like this, like godlike figure that has been hyped up entering the movie. And, you know, he does go pretty quick, but I, I feel like to me, when he returns, he represents almost like someone who has, gone away and like found themselves and came back almost and they're like a new person and they kind of want to see change and they and they want to be a leader for good kind of like um i think a good analogy would just be like maybe this is the best analogy but picture like like someone who was really cool in high school and and they come back but they're not like 
like a, a they're actually not like just the loser like 20 year old who wants to hang out with high schoolers they like actually come back and like impart real wisdom and knowledge on on the kids because i feel like if i remember right he comes back and he really like tells the kids some wisdom about life like he doesn't seem like this bad gang boss who's really violent he seems like he just wants to like talk out the situation because i feel like he is overcome like this whole competitive like aspect of oh we need to kill the other gang because we just need to win it's like he's he's now realized because i believe he takes a vacation somewhere uh, he's realized that there's like more to life than just this little community where and, and like these these social dynamics that mean everything to the kids are not what life is really about and it's not really what's important um what did you think did you feel the same way so uh, i love that kind of um that idea that he he almost like transcended it and like his death was the you know the punctuation of that transcendence and as you were kind of just describing this archetype my mind couldn't help but going to one of the films that we talked about in the past, and this is a Francis Ford Coppola film, Rumblefish. It's almost like Mickey Rorick's character, where he's the yeah. the larger than life kind of guy who's imparting his wisdom on the younger generation. Let me know, like, let me lay this down, and it's it's pretty much just just putting a really big spin on what you said. And I really don't know one to be right over the other, but I want to get your opinion on it. It's like to your point, the time away from the gang had opened his eyes to like the world outside of just conflict and this being our corner, this being their corner and just fight and like just needing to have the edge over the other people. Yet he's dragged back into it and he finds himself in a conflict. And it's almost as though the scale of the conflict has has outgrown who he is, despite him kind of being this like living legend type of character. And I think it's like, you know, in gang warfare, you see escalation is the name of the game. Honestly, like, you know, they have a pistol. Let's get a rifle. They have a semi auto. Let's get an automatic. Like that's gang warfare to it, to a T and like, especially seeing that in America. And I feel like his character is kind of important to show that the escalation of violence is, getting to a point where it is greater than just one person, I guess. So he's, he's there to show that there's a life in a world outside of the gang warfare, but also to show that like this, the direction that it has gone in his short absence has outgrown him for kind of lack of better phrasing. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, and I think that's shown by when he comes back. He doesn't seem well like they're kind of grouping up when they're by that street as if they want to all jump him and, and attack him. He doesn't seem scared. It's kind of like you know he realizes he's like better than this. Like he's moved on from this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like the best analogy I thought of, and this may just be because you know I watch a lot of crime stuff and I know I know about different aspects of crime. Is that like in in like modern day gangs in America, a lot of the times you see like they'll call them like OGs or old heads, and they're these usually like forty plus year old guys who it's like they just become mentors and they try and get these young guys to stop what they're doing. And I, I feel like that's Honey's character. They're like imparting wisdom. They're they're telling these guys that like look like. I've lost like, like all my friends and my family to gang violence. Like, and it may seem cool and fun when you're young, but when you get older, if, if you even make it out alive, 
it's not cool at all. And like, you know, no one went through this and all, all you end up with is, is essentially nothing. Like you, you lose everything in this pursuit of like one upping the other side of like trying to win. It's like this fruitless endeavor in the end. It's pointless. And, and I think that's kind of what his character represents. And I think it's, it's very, you know, interesting how, how quickly he just goes and, you know, right when he goes, it's, it's back to that whole one upsman ship of like the other person, like trying to outdo the other, his voice of reason is, is silenced in this, like in this war that these two groups have against each other. And I think that's, you know, that happens all the time in real life in, in any of these kinds of conflicts. I, I agree. And to, to take that point further, as far as like how out of control it's getting and like honey is unable to help either side and it just keeps growing and getting bigger. This conflict, I feel like, and this was one of the characters whose names eludes me. But he was kind of having a side relationship with Ming. He is one of the he's the character who is said to have killed another student with his samurai sword. But his family, like he has guns now and that is getting introduced into the mix. And like you can see where the future of this conflict is can go through him that like things are going to progress and get worse. And on top of that, you get this added element where sir or seer or sir kind of represents like the unknown element, just kind of being dropped into this world and having to adapt. And you see that his family finds him or thinks of him to be a really good kid. And despite this all, he commits what could be considered to be maybe the most heinous act of the entire film, which spoiler alert for a brighter summer day, but it is when he kills Ming and no one had really kind of crossed that line, obviously in crime or at least in prison. Um, it's kind of looked down upon to kill a woman and he is the only person in the mix to finally do that in a film filled with violence. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, there's all these different things happening in this, in this movie so much we could talk about, but that is, you know, Sir is, and his story with Ming and, and is, is the main, you know, kind of storyline. So I think that's really what Yang was trying to, get across was like it's to me it's like that's it's like and I, I think this is the story you know you find in other movies as well where it's kind of like you were you have the good kid who's like thrown into this situation and it's like it's as if the situation makes him into a completely different person that you would have never expected at the end and i and i think you know besides the the, the big battle and the and kind of the climax of the movie I think the other most very surprising thing to me was was the fact that he does that with Ming. Like I kind of saw it coming a little towards the end, but I really wasn't expecting him to do that. And it's just this very like well done and shocking moment in the movie that like I the only like movie I can think of right now to compare that moment where he stabs Ming to is when um John Wayne's character like embraces uh the woman or I I can't, I can't remember who she is but uh, like basically the climax of the searchers mm. when w- do you know what moment I'm talking about like that's a cinematic moment that will always like stay with me it's like that same like gasp like like oh my gosh like this this moment in this film and and is like why I watch like movies like did you feel that same way? Cause like I, the scene, it's so surprising and, and it's just, I don't know. Maybe it was cause I was so invested in the characters. I was just like, wow, this is, this is like why I watch movie. He's been, this is, I'll, I'll like never forget this moment of this movie. Like if I 
10 years down the line, if I forget most of the movie, I will still remember this moment. I completely agree. I mean, just a, a, a tremendous cinematic moment. I, I was so shocked because, and, and I, I'm sure you felt this way too. You are almost led to believe that he is going to fight the guy with whom the relationship yeah. is opposed to her. And just a, a, a subtle little thing that I think makes the moment even better because you're in such shock and you stay on the shot and it's almost like the people around him because he does it like, you know, essentially in the middle of a town square. Like there's just like little markets, people walking, people shopping and they like realize it almost as us, the audience members, are coming to grasps with what we just witnessed. It's just so well done from that. Like, that little detail just underlines how good of a scene that was. They, they zoom out right after he does it, and you see, like, everyone's kind of going about their normal business in that area or in the shopping centers. And then it's like you see her drop and no one realizes it. And then you're right, like right as everyone starts realizing, you kind of real – like it kind of goes through your mind what just happened because, you know, I, I just didn't expect that for the character. Uh, you know, not even in the middle of the film, he always seemed like – like he, he seemed like his anger issues were getting worse, but I never would have thought he would have gone to that level. But it's like kind of like everything in his life was like building up to that point. I completely agree. And so we, we kind of touched upon the dad and, and do you feel like he kind of symbolizes like, because he kind of gets, he just kind of gets out of it. Like without there being like a, a notable conclusion to the whole investigation that they were kind of putting him under. I mean, do, do you think that, entire storyline is just to kind of serve that there's still aspects of the old country that 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 still exists in Taiwan or like that's kind of the way I look at it how how did you kind of look at that entire storyline I did see it that way um I I cuz like my first thought was Okay, this must have been something uh, like when Taiwan, you know, first be became its own thing or its own country with its own culture. They might have still had these like non democratic types of interrogation that you would see in like the USSR or, or something where they would just take you in. And if they even thought that you could be guilty of, of something that they don't like, they might just execute you or throw you in prison. Um, but, you know, I was trying to think of what else that might like rep represent. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe this is just kind of like a, a terrorizers thing where, uh, you, you realize that, you know, the dad, like you see the dad really trying the, his best to, to get sir like into a good school. Like he's very focused on making sure he tries to get good grades. I think he's trying to get him into a day school instead of a night school. Mm -hmm. Like you could see he's very caring, but I think maybe this, this is trying to highlight how the adults along with the kids were going through their own process of trying to come to terms with this new culture. Um, and, and, you know, cause, cause I think part of what I remember them accusing him of is they're, they're asking him if he knows all these people. I think they're trying to see if he's affiliated with some sort of espionage group or, or something that goes against the interests of the government. And I think maybe he's just trying to highlight that the adults in this time, maybe maybe his, this happened to his dad, that maybe, like the adults in this time were going through their own like kind of warfare, uh, in a sense, with the government or... Um, that they're like just trying to fit this new reality into their old life, and they're like conflicted themselves to where they they 
they probably don't like their minds aren't fully there for their kids. Like, like if you have a family and you're raising them in America and you, you know, that's, that's your whole plan in life. You, you kind of have expectations of, of what it's going to be like, but, but say you live in America, the American South and the South like secedes in the middle of you trying to raise a family. Well, now you as a person, as the adult, like, how are you going to put your focus and attention on your children when you have to deal with, with all this crap in your life yourself? Um, I think it, maybe he was trying to go for something like that. I agree. I, I think you made some, some really good points there and how it's, it's the whole of everyone who lives there. You know, it's not just the youth adapting to this. It's everyone. It's the whole family unit is facing these different challenges and how they differ from one another. Uh, a couple of the characters that I kind of want to ask you about as well. Well, two, one that I just want to bring up and then the other is someone who kind of, I mentioned previously, but I like the, the singer of the group. He seems like the youngest though. I, I'm only assuming because he's in the same classes as sir, that he's the sim same age, but he's obviously the smallest in stature. But I really like that character because I think he is supposed to also symbolize that like there is a way out and his way out is kind of through talent. Like he has a very, like a great singing voice and that his commitment to this aspect of his life is a ticket out of this. And we see this in, in gangs in the United States. I mean, obviously, or not in gangs, but where gang warfare is really pre prevalent. Um, there could be people who make it out through musical or athletic talents. That's often the main ways that you'll see them make it out is through talent. And then we have the other character who I've mentioned before and who I kind of see as like foreshadowing of like th how the escalation of violence could go. But it's the character who Ming is the maid for and also ends up kind of having like this on like not this unofficial kind of relationship. What are your thoughts on those two characters? Um, so I'll, I'll just, uh, say about the singer. He was also one of my favorites, um, if not my favorite character. Um, and I, I, I think your interpretation of like the reason, you know, the singing as a way to get out is, is interesting. I actually did not think about that. I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I thought he was and that, you know, this is all, you know, obviously completely interpretive. I thought he represent because he did seem younger, and I thought the whole time, even though in the same class, maybe they were just in a weird class, and he was really was a few years younger, and they just kind of all had the same class together. But regardless, to me, he represented like um, a young person at the time who didn't understand. He he never experienced the old ways before Taiwan had become its own country. Um, and I think he, like, like he was adopting all these Western, like he was the, he, all these Western things. Like he loved Elvis and he loved, um, singing like songs in, in English, or I guess he was probably just lip syncing them. But to, to me, he like his obsession with Western music and a little bit Western culture represented like a young person in Taiwan or a very, very young person in Taiwan who didn't have, who couldn't miss, you know, old times. And he was just purely excited about the, this, these new or, or like Western culture becoming it coming into Taiwan. He, it, like it was all very new and fresh for him. And instead of uh, like, like older people do, they, they don't like new things as much. He was embraced those new things. Um, and, and, but can you remind me about the second person you were talking about? Cause I don't exactly recall. He was, so they said he killed a student with his samurai sword. He had, Oh yeah. That guy. 
Yeah, yeah, and and he was friends with, with um, he was the one that I thought we thought Sir was going to kill at the end, right? Yeah, yeah, him for me, I I didn't get like I didn't quite understand his character's place as much as I did, um, with the singer. I I I would like to know what you think about that because I like to me he was just like one of the group like i he didn't stand out to me in any particular way but i would like to know what you think because because i think i i might end up agreeing with it so i mean he he kind of introduces the use of a sword um he introduces guns to sir i feel like he is like where things could go like he's a, like the spearhead of the violent conflict and he's kind of escalating things. And I'm trying to think of like how that would be extrapolated if you're kind of like to zoom out and look at what that's trying to say on like a, a national level. And I think it's just like maybe like a civil war could perhaps take place in Taiwan and he's like representing civil unrest when like with the battle of ideologies, that's kind of like my like 5,000 yard view at his character. I did find like, cause I, fi- I find it to be very integral to that character that he does like introduce the samurai swords. And then I believe after that we have that huge, kind of mass killing and then we see him use guns and you can only extrapolate where that goes to. So that, that was just kind of like what I got from that character though. I do think the way he kind of looks at the relationship with women as well, especially Ming to also, I think be very telling about that character. And that's the part that I haven't yet cracked and might actually kind of fully unveil who and what he is. Well, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, I know he was wealthy and, and all the things you said, maybe he kind of like what you were saying is like the bad influence character. Like he doesn't, he seems to enjoy the violence. Um, he seems to uh, like, like he would never get past it because he feels like it's okay. Same, same thing when, when uh sir found out he was with ming he just kind of acts like sir is crazy for caring about it in the first place it seems like his his character is is like maybe the embodiment of that violent like psychopathic type of mindset where he's just interested in doing whatever he wants and he just happens to like violent things and he can also get away with what he wants due to his wealth. That's a, that's a really interesting aspect. I haven't, I didn't really thought about his wealth playing a huge role, but I think you're dead on the money when it comes to that. And you do find that to often be the case that I think people, well, you have like a longer leash, obviously when you have resources behind you and you kind of become accustomed to that. Matt, I, I want to ask you, before we get to our ratings, is there any kind of final thoughts or additional aspects that you'd like to touch on before we rate this film? Hmm. Um, I mean, I, you know, I could say the cinematography is, is, uh, was just as good, if not better than terrorizers. I feel like he, um, he, the whole film it makes it, it it all is beautiful like uh, unlike like terrorizes i feel is a little more grimy and dark brighter summer day is is very bright and it's it feels like it it, it like the way he uses maybe lighting it just makes the film and the air like like it it makes it look very dreamy kind of like Mm. like i picture when they're walking through that field like that's a very i think it's the the cover 
on the on letterbox like um they're walking through that wheat field or it's tall grass to me that like scene like kind of represents how i how i view the movie in terms of its images like it's it seems happy but the themes are very dark um so i guess that's the only i I don't know how much we could you know discuss that but that's like that's the only thing i would add is just uh the way the film looks visually i is is absolutely stunning to me and i think uh, that's in part because i watched it uh in 4k at the theater um which was which is an awesome experience and and i just you know i get I got so caught up and and immersed in the film at the theater, dude. You know, because of the cinematography and then all the characters and everything. Yeah, I, I think you you brought up a good point that it really hadn't occurred to me, but it's certainly worth noting is that there's a huge juxtaposition between how bright and dreamy, like you said, this film is. And underlying that is like all this violence and conflict and kind of unknown for lack of a better term. I really like that. And it just kind of speaks to the brilliance of Edward Yang. I I, I love this film. I, I, I don't I won't beat around the bush. I mean, I thought it was amazing and great recommendation from you matt i gave it a five out of five what say you yeah i I initially gave it a four and a half and i i think i already told you it was because i was in these kind of rather uncomfortable theater seats for four hours and i was kind of ready for it to be done at the end mostly because i was uncomfortable um so i would say if you watch it definitely you know take a break as needed i i feel like that would have been nice but i would definitely rate this you know now that it sat with me for a few weeks uh five stars it is definitely a personal favorite um i i just feel like if you're willing to to spend four hours watching this movie you will almost surely get something out of it and i can almost guarantee you will not forget this film um I agree. And just to to close things up, and I want to let you also speak to, I guess, just Edward Yang as a whole. Um, From what I've seen, what I've read, obviously he is pretty well known with the Letterboxd community just because his films are so highly rated. But he's said to be kind of like the best director you've never seen and obviously we have, but just generally he's, he's under kind of underwhelming as far as popularity goes. But if you really enjoy movies that are deeply thematic, interestingly told and well shot, and you do not mind foreign films or films that you can kind of think about to really get to the heart of, than which and I think a lot of all of those things are something that a lot of film goers are looking for. Um, Edward Yang is is the guy. What what would you say about Edward Yang, the director, Matt? Yeah, I would say if you love, um, you know, slice of life type movies, if you like. Uh, and, and the brighter summer day sense, if you like coming of age movies, this is one of the best coming of age movies I've ever seen. Um, it, you know, if you enjoy watching movies where you like to connect on a personal level to the movie instead of just like pure entertainment, like if you're going to a movie and you just want to be entertained, you know, I love tons of movies that are like that, but I would say this movie is not like that. Like it, it's entertaining, but. I, I didn't, you know, walk out of it in the same way I would have uh, walked out of like a typical blockbuster movie. I walked out of this movie thinking a lot about, um, I guess, just life in general. Like, like there's a, some directors, and they're usually my favorite directors, just because I'm, I'm like a philosophical type person. Um, there's some directors that really leave you with, with like, when you think about certain things in life. Um, that you'll think of that movie or if you want to say, Hey, 
or someone says, show me a movie about like, about what life is like. Like if you were wanting to show an alien that had no, had never been to earth before and you wanted to say, this is kind of what life is like. I think a brighter summer day and I'm guessing Yee Yee because I, I haven't seen it would be the perfect movie to show an alien to, because I feel like it captures, he's able to capture so many like themes of life in his movies. And he's able to like tell these super interesting stories about like just life in general. Um, and that it, it just, to me, it's, it's breathtaking. And I think it does make him one of the best directors to, to ever live because I mean, a task like, making a movie about life or that like embodies what, what life is like on earth is like, I think one of the hardest things to do. So I, yeah, I just think he's, he's incredible at being able to like make you think and, and, and yeah. Yeah. I I couldn't have said it better myself. You, you hit the nail on the head, Matt, first and foremost, thank you for joining. But also on top of that, this episode would not have happened had you not recommended Edward Yang. And it's been some of my favorite films that I've watched over the course of the past two weeks. So thank you very much for recommending these and just introducing me to me to, like you said, and I completely agree, one of the best directors to have ever lived. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. That's all from us. Thank you for joining us, and we will catch you on the Flippity Floop. Bye, y'all.